Okay, so we at Rockland Public Library have, of course, moved into virtual programming for the time being, along with uh, most other libraries in the state. So we thank you very much for your support. And I would like to start by thanking the friends of Rockland Public Library for their support, not only of this program, but for our programming all year long, both virtual and on site. And speaking of the wonderful friends of Rockland Public Library, they have a special fundraiser coming up soon that sort of ties into tonight's topic. Um, because their typical spring and summer fundraisers cannot take place for obvious reasons this year, they have come up with the great idea of doing an open garden. So various people throughout Rockland will be opening up their gardens to the public between June 20th and July 11th. And you can check out the library's newsletter and our website and Facebook page for more information about that fantastic program. I would also like to tell you about two virtual programs that are coming up next Thursday at 2 p.m. We will welcome Ann Luther, and she will be giving a talk on the struggle for women's suffrage, which was originally intended for last March for Women's History Month. Uh, that will take place next Thursday, and please note the two o'clock start time for that. It should be very informative, and I imagine we will all learn something. Then two weeks from then on July 9th, we will have a virtual author talk with Rockland author Judith Carpenter. Judith is going to talk about her book, The Uninvited Goddess. That will be Thursday, July 9th at 6.30, also on Zoom. If you're interested in either of those events, please send me an email at sbillings at rocklandmaine.gov and I will make sure you get the link for the respective program. Uh, tonight, I am so pleased to welcome journalist and garden expert Tom Atwell. And I will let you know that Tom is going to take questions from all of you. So please feel free to utilize the chat box. If you're afraid that you'll forget your question, you can type it at any time. Um, I will be monitoring for questions. Tom is going to check in a couple of times and then he'll have a Q&A at the end as well. If you prefer to use the raise hand feature um, to have me unmute you to ask your question, um, feel free to try that feature. But remember that if you do that and I unmute you, you will appear um, on the video unless you have your settings to not show yourself. So please be aware that you can use the chat box um, at any time starting now with your questions. So Tom Atwell, as I said, journalist and garden expert, he writes the well-known column Maine Gardener for the Portland Press Herald. Tom was born in Skowhegan, Maine, and he received a degree in journalism from the University of Maine. Then he spent two years in the army, including a stint in Vietnam. He began his journalism career afterwards, which took him first to the Lewiston Sun and then to the Portland Press Herald. He started the Maine Gardener column in 2004, but luckily for all of us, he continued writing it after his retirement. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over the Zoom platform to Tom Atwell. Tom, take okay, it away. Thank you. Uh, now, what, one thing I never claim to be is a garden expert. I'm a journalist and my topic is gardening. My wife, who's done garden club stuff, knows a, a lot more about gardening than I am. I just happen to be the writer uh, and, and the gardener too. And then I write about what I do and I go to lectures and I can do it like reporting. But there are so many things that I don't know that it's almost scary. Uh, uh, but okay, so that's aside the point. So w welcome here. You're in I'm talking to you from the corner of my vegetable garden because it's shady uh, with the garden uh, shed that uh, we put in this year uh, behind me as a good uh, backdrop to show what it is. If there's anything that I talk about that you actually want to see, if it's not going to make you dizzy, I'll 
walk over and try to show it to you, which is part of the reason for sitting out here in the garden. Not only that, but it's really uh, kind of uh, cool and windy out here, so it's comfortable. Uh, now, this has been an odd garden year for a lot of reasons, and not just the fact that everyone is stuck at home with uh, you know, social distancing restrictions, uh, whatever. I had thought early on that this might be awful for garden centers. And I did a, th a column just before uh, Mother's Day saying, oh, how are you gonna survive Mother's Day? And the response I got uh, from most of the garden centers is, we've been busier than we've ever been. People are stuck at home. They've got their properties. They want to do stuff, and they're here. Uh, a lot of people, you know, are either retirees and whatever, and still have the same amount of income that they have. I, I feel fortunate to be in that group. Uh, you know, I I haven't lost any, and you can't spend it on going out to eat or anything. So they're spending it on plants because they bring them home, plant them, keep themselves busy and uh, are improving their properties. It's a really good way to spend time. Uh, I, I don't normally do this, and this is, should be part of the vegetable talk, which is coming later, but I planted my lettuce in a coal frame the day I found out that uh, my duplicate bridge games were gonna be closed because of the COVID-19. Uh, and I was depressed because that's what I do during the winter. Uh, and it just, it gave me something to do, to think about. So, and I was picking lettuce first of May. So it's a good thing, but so everyone is improving their property because they've got the time to do it. They can come home and plant whatever they want. If they've got an ugly plant that they didn't like, they can, cut it down, dig it up, and move it and get rid of it. It's wide open. Um, so, and again, nurseries are essential, essential businesses. And when we were trying to find uh, geraniums to put on the family uh, uh, cemetery plots uh, before Memorial Day weekend, there were some places we couldn't get in because the parking lots were full. So go off times. I don't know if they have senior hours or not. But simple rules, plant whatever you like. There are no rules. If you want to mix colors that other people say you shouldn't, do it. Uh, if you want to plants close together, do it. Uh, you know, I like, uh, you know, physocarpus and, and different plants with red and yellow foliage. A lot of people think that looks strange. Do what you want. It's your garden. Um, and you, so, and, and you've got all the time in the world. You can just come out here. You don't work till you get tired. Just work until you feel like it and then go in and read or uh, pay attention to the, uh, uh, well, I try to avoid the news of too many political commercials, but that's uh, just, you know, just work until you don't, you're not having fun anymore, because at this time of year, having fun is the most important thing. Now, um, my first rule is that curb appeal is overrated. Now, this isn't just because my house is on a plot that was part of my wife's grandparents' uh, truck farm in Cape Elizabeth uh, many years ago. And uh, we have a long driveway to get uh, to a plot that wasn't sold as part of the nearby subdivision because it didn't have frontage. So I have no curb appeal. But even if I did, I would want to have What's more important than anything is how the garden looks from the house. You want to make sure that the garden is really beautiful looking out front 
from the, the kitchen sink. The window over the kitchen sink is where we spend so much time preparing food, cleaning dishes, washing our hands, everything. That is a really important view. I have a second floor office, uh, which looks out and when I can't think of what I'm writing or I'm trying to calm myself with someone's weird Facebook post, I just look out the window and enjoy the garden. So, and you know, the living room, you want to look out and see the garden from your house because this is your garden it's not the garden that belongs to the people who are driving up and down the street uh, for that reason you really shouldn't care about foundation plantings everybody has them you uh you, you know you, you you go you buy a house we built had a house built uh and we went to o'donnell's and what the woman who waited on us did was said okay gave us a bunch of plans up by to put at the foundation i only see them when i'm driving in and out of the house or mowing the lawn so those are should not be the important thing and the other problem with uh foundation planning is that you always plant the wrong ones. You get ones that are you know, nice little plants that look good when you put them in your garden, but you don't realize that they're going to grow to be 10 feet and they're going to cover the windows. And you're not going to be able to look out the windows if you don't spend a lot of time pruning them back to keep them below the windows. Some people shear them and they, well, you know, with shears instead of actually doing pruning, uh, and they're cutting off all the blossoms and they make them a little, you know, uh, muffin shaped shrubs that don't really have any character. So when you're buying a plant, buy, you know, every label will say this plant, when it gets to its ultimate height, is going to be four feet wide and six feet tall or 12 feet tall and six feet six feet wide whatever study that and um so you know that you're not gonna have to prune it to keep it from covering the window you know you know if it's away from the house and you're going to be looking out at it you don't mind if it gets to be 12 feet tall we've got some rhododendrons that are 10 feet tall at the corner of our house that are absolutely wonderful they uh uh, are huge, they're in blossom, they look good when they aren't in blossom. Uh, now, and one rule uh, that I don't have to worry about this anymore, when it says ultimate height on a uh, plant in the nursery, what they're talking about is what it's going to be in 10 years. Well, I'm in my 70s and 10 years is probably all I've got. But if you're 20 something and you're buying your first house and planning to uh, stay there until you retire, that plant will get larger than the ultimate height. So, but don't worry about that part of it. Okay, I'm gonna have to finally look at my notes and see what I do if I'm covering what I'm supposed to. Um, yeah, um, now you should prune for the health of the plant. And uh, that is something that I do actually did yesterday on our property uh spring plants you prune after they go by the flowers go by and start so we did our lilacs and some of the early viburnums and plants like that the quince uh and you get rid of the crossing branches well obviously any dead branches crossing branches that are rubbing against each other and ones that are just going in weird directions. Uh, all other plants that plant late June or later, it's best to go out in March and prune those to take care of them. Because uh, A, it gives you something to do when you're not really busy, pick a warm day to do it. And it's better for, you can see, you know, they don't have leaves, you can see the shape of the branches better and it works well uh, on that. Um, let's see, yeah, now 
let's talk about the lawn a little bit. Um, in the typical all-American suburb, lawns are the prime piece of property. I mean, they cover most of it. It's what people see. Uh, lawns are biologically a desert. There are no pollinators for the, uh, no, no plants to feed the pollinators. They take too much water, especially the way it's been so far this year where we've had a third of an inch of rain since May 15th. Uh, that's not enough. Your garden needs, uh, uh, an, your lawn needs at least an inch of rain a week. Uh, I, I'm a hose dragger and I've uh, watered an inch every 10 days, vegetable garden, flower gardens, everything. Uh, we don't have a sprinkler system because our lawn isn't that large. Uh, it used to be larger, but we kept expanding our flower beds, or perennial beds and things like that. So that um, we could, uh, so we just got rid of the lawn. Now, if you uh, play wiffle ball out on the lawn, you actually do badminton or croquet or you use part of a lawn, sure. Anything that's fun outdoors, that's what you should be doing, especially now that you're stuck home all the time. But our lawn, which gets no chemicals and is a large part violets rather than uh, actual grass, uh, we just use as a path. It's a place where we can walk easily to get to the flower beds when we want to cut flowers, uh, pick flowers, uh, look at flowers, plant flowers, whatever. So, so I'm not anti-lawn. It's probably more environmentally friendly than uh, concrete or pavers, but uh, it's not as uh, good as having flowers growing. Um, now, and talking about pollinators, um, you should have something in blossom all year long. Uh, you know, from early on with the tulips, you know, daffodils come up early and uh, the bulbs, and then just have something in bloom all the time, partly because you're gonna wanna look at it, but also because, uh, you know, bees, native bees, honeybees, which aren't native, uh, are all, in uh, you know, in peril to an extent. The the, uh, the Department of Horticulture says uh, people uh, uh, they are all suffering, and what they need is food and nectar all the time. So you want to plan your garden, uh, you know, and the labels again tell you when the uh, plant will bloom, and you look from year to year, and if you discover okay. I don't have any bloom on June 20th. Uh, okay, I gotta go out there and buy a specific plant that's gonna be uh, in blossom at that point. Now, some people say you should only plant natives. Well, I didn't know about that when I, uh, we moved here in 1975 and uh, we didn't plant all natives. We probably planted mostly non-natives. We were very careful, except for burning bush, which we've gotten rid of, to plant nothing that has ended up on the uh, state's invasive plant lists, which are no longer allowed to be sold. Uh, so you, so just, you know, do get some natives. We, uh, Nancy and I, uh, Maine Audubon Society in Falmouth, is has go ongoing now a native plant sale. Oh, by the way, I, I should have said, it, if there are any questions, uh, I'm willing to be interrupted at any point. I just sort of ramble on and don't think about it. And especially with this kind of setup where I can't see facial reaction, it's a little bit uh, uh, tougher than when I'm speaking live. But uh, yeah, so yeah, do plant natives. We bought uh, probably 15 or 16 
uh, native plants from uh, the Audubon Society. Uh, and we've got a shade section that is just bad lawn that I'm slowly trying to get rid of to have mostly native plants. And that's good. Uh, Doug Tallamy in, uh, wrote, wrote the book, Bringing Nature Home. I think it's about 12 years ago now, but I can't remember exactly, which sort of changed, you know, because with the idea of if you want birds in your yard, don't get a bird feeder. Plant native plants that attract native bugs, which are what the birds eat. Most birds prefer to eat the native bugs, insects that they grew up with, which are attractive by the, the native flowers, which is, you know, and that's why you want to plant native. Also, if you've got room, plant huge trees. Uh, red maples, sugar maples, not Norway maples. Uh, my neighbor has some, they shade me out, and I've been picking up tiny maple and oak trees all year, although the oaks are native. But they're the trees that hold carbon that uh, help slow down carbon change. So those are the kind of uh, plants you want to have. Wild Seed Project, which is, I think, in your area. I want to say owl said, but it might not be. Uh, but uh, it uh, sells seeds that you plant as opposed to the uh, small shrubs and uh, seedlings that are available at Maine Audubon. Uh, you can um, you can buy those and plant those, and they're great. Uh, uh, you grow them over the winter mostly. Uh, Heather McCargo might have talked at your library and uh, do things. She's talked to everywhere in the state, I think. And uh, so, what, uh, uh, but she will come and teach you how to plant these seeds and do things like that. Um, okay, time, time to change pages here. Um, And uh, yeah, so, so as I said, you don't have to pick just native plants, but I would definitely uh, go with as many native plants as you can because A, they look good. Uh, I bought from Fedco, which is inexpensive, bare root nanny berries. After I saw them, we have a camp uh, near Bethel, uh, it's closer to a shack than a camp. Uh, and I was walking up the woods uh, along the stream that it's on and it had uh, the nanny berries were in bloom one year and they were everywhere. And I bought three nanny berries from Fedco. And I, I should have said this earlier, when you're buying plants, you can buy big plants that look big and cost you, you know, five gallon plants, rolled in burlap plants, or one two gallon plants. Uh, and the big ones cost a lot more and will look good when you first put them in. If you want instant impact, that's what you should buy. But studies have been done that the transplant shock for those huge larger plants is such that they're set back a long time. So after 10 years, the ultimate growth time, on all of these plants. Uh, the small plants will catch up with the big plants and surpass them in health, size, vigor. So you save some money and overall it's better to plant small seedlings rather than big seedlings. The nurseries hate to hear that occasionally. Uh, and and, uh, and you know, native plants can be accidental. Uh, I, uh, with my wife and other uh, Cape Elizabeth Garden Club members, uh, took over the job of taking care of the landscape at Thomas Memorial Library here in Cape Elizabeth. And some uh, milkweed accidentally started showing up, or maybe some kids planted it that we didn't know about. But we just left it because it's so great for the monarch butterflies. Monarchs need, you know, and this was the standard milkweed, not the swamp milkweed or the butterfly weed, which are different types of Asclepias, which is a scientific name. And they looked really good. 
They uh, had good flowers. They had the great seeds that blow all over the place. So the milkweed fell, fit in really well on what is a fairly formal library garden. So that covers what I was going to talk about on uh, improving your property, but I'll take any questions you want at this point. Okay, Tom, we do have a question from an audience member asking if you can please name some native plants that you have gotten or which are easily found. Okay, so the, the, there are many uh, viburnums. Uh, there are native and non-native uh, viburnums. Uh, Nanny berry is uh, uh, one of them. There's a, a wild, see, uh, yeah, uh, wild raisin, which is another viburnum. Uh, the my favorite uh, rhododendron, rose bay rhododendron, is native. There are non-native rhododendrons and hybrids, but that's a good 12 foot rhododendron, that's native. All of your calmia or mountain laurel are native. We're talking shrubs there. Um, there's liatris, uh, uh, echinacea, uh, which is a uh, coneflower, uh, black-eyed Susan, brown-eyed Susan, asters. Asters are anyone who doesn't have a whole bunch of different kinds of asters is missing out because they come in late in the season and they are beautiful right up until frost. Uh, a great plant to have here. I, uh, I didn't bring my catalog out, and sort of, but, uh, but go on to uh, the main Audubon, Audubon, uh, I can talk, main Audubon Society website and they've got a list of the plants that they're selling and a whole native, oh, my notes blew away, a whole native plant, a uh, bunch of information there. Uh, uh, wow, I'm looking at it and I can't think of the name. Uh, uh, yeah, Midwest, uh, yeah, no, they, but yeah, I, I'm slipping up on that, but there are really a lot of good native plants. They will uh, um, go, uh, go to the local nurseries up there and I'm sure that they have a catalog which will separate it as well. But the Maid Audubon uh, website has a good list on that. Sheep Laurel is another one. Um, that is, I'm thinking shrubs there, but a lot of different uh, ones that you can go for. Excellent. Um, I just want to remind people that at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you should have a chat feature. And if you click on that, you can feel free to type in any questions that you have for Tom, and we will check in again for further questions later. It looks like that was the only one in the chat box at this moment. Okay, so the second half is on vegetables. Now, it's not too late to grow vegetables this year. I mean, the weather has been awful, uh, to put it mildly. You know, not, not awful, it's a nice day, it's good, to, but it's been tough for gardeners because uh, while March and early April were warm, beginning in late April and through May, it's been chilly and through early June as well. But while it's been chilly, it hasn't rained. So it's been sort of tough for your vegetables. Uh, I know that uh, the general rule is that you plant your tender vegetables like um, tomatoes, peppers, squash, seedlings on Memorial Day. Well, this year, on uh, the old fashioned Memorial Day, not the one that we actually celebrate it now, uh, there was a frost in much of Maine. I had um, a reader in Cape Elizabeth who lived in a different area who actually had um, his tomatoes damaged by the cold weather on May 30th, which was, you just don't hear about it. So if you 
didn't get to your vegetable garden or uh, you've had problems with what you've planted, it's not too late to plant vegetables now. Um, as a matter of fact, yeah, you know, I, I planted lettuce March 15th, as I told you, under a cold frame, and it worked. Uh, but that lettuce is going to be getting old pretty soon. So I planted a second planting of lettuce. You do the same thing with uh, beets, you know, uh, all of those uh, beets, carrots, uh, Swiss chard. Uh, you want to eat those plants when they're fairly young. Uh, so that, that's what, uh, so keep planting throughout the year. You can plant uh, beans or another plant that you want to uh, grow in succession because uh, they taste better when they're you know, just barely small and tender rather than they get big and starchy. So plant, do bean crops every two or three weeks. So you'll have them coming fresh and nice uh, throughout the course of the year. Um, you can still go out at this point and buy uh, tomato seedlings, pepper seedlings, summer squash seedlings. It might be just a little bit late to uh, go with winter squash, but if you want to give it a try, why not? What have you got to lose? Uh, so I would like to have people continue doing that. I, I'm doing that in my own garden. I haven't had to replant the tomatoes, but I am doing succession plantings of beans and uh, so forth. I haven't done peas as yet, and I won't this year because my uh, pea-loving uh, sister-in-law won't be coming up because of the uh, travel restrictions and stuff. But, uh, but at times, if she's coming late in the season, I will plant a variety of peas called Wando which you can plant right about now. It's one of the few that'll put up with hot weather and still taste good in August when you pick it. So, uh, and uh, so, yeah, you can do uh, plant beans. Uh, you can, uh, all of that stuff. Uh, there was a question there that uh, I didn't see the end of. Okay, so we have a question can I plant bush beans after my garlic is harvested? How about snap peas? Okay, you could, I think you could plant uh, bush beans after your garlic is harvested. Because uh, I just noticed, uh, and I didn't get to cut them all off, but the garlic scapes have just uh, uh, come out on mine and I'm gonna have to go through and cut them off pretty soon. And I like getting a lot of garlic. Uh, and so generally, you uh, should dig your garlic two or three weeks after the scapes uh, are cut because uh, you don't want to let the whole plant die like you do with onions. And, and, and since you're asking about the garlic, I think you don't want to know that, Linda, but I think the other people might uh, wonder about this. Uh, so. Yeah, cut the garlic scapes off, dig the garlic in probably three weeks. You could plant um, bush beans at that time. I think you'd have good luck. Uh, now, what you wanna do then is, again, check the label, always read the label. So buy a variety of bush beans that will, and it'll tell you how many days it is to harvest. So, uh, and bush beans like hot weather, so that, that'll work especially well. So how many days it is to harvest, so you add that to the current day, and if, if it's gonna be ripe before what the first average frost is for your area, and if you're along the coast like I am, that's probably September 20th to October 1st. Although for the last couple of years, it's gone into late October here. Yeah, you can plant those. You'll have time for that, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> um, and, and, that, and, that's, and, and beans are a great 
Oh, you're in Wells. Okay, so you you're fine. Um, yeah, because the uh, beans. I read this uh, just uh, online, and I didn't really know it. People talk about zucchini as being the most prolific, produces the most food. Well, beans actually outproduce for calories per crop zucchini. You can get a whole bunch of them on uh, just a bunch of, uh, on bush beans or even pole beans. I'm growing both kinds of beans this year. As a matter of fact, just uh, let's look. There are my uh, uh, pole beans We're sitting right beside them there. Uh, uh, so yeah, it, that uh, beans would be well after uh, after your garlic should work well. Um, Tom, we have a question. Can you please talk about companion plants? Okay, that, and I don't have this all memorized, but I did a column um, a while back. It, it, it helps to have different uh, flowers in among uh, the vegetables because you know, marigolds, for example, will repel, repel certain amount of insects. There's the old three sisters of beans, squash, and corn, where you plant the three together because the um, corn gets tall, the beans will cl climb up the uh, corn, and the uh, the big leaves of the squash will keep the uh, uh, the ground moist and uh, uh, healthy and cool. And that's one of the tricks that the pilgrims learned from the uh, native people who are here at that time, because that's the way they grew their vegetables. And, you know, Three Sisters is a, a good method of uh, doing your gardens today. Uh, if you want. Uh, and I wish I uh, had written the notes on what the specific uh, companion planting are. But, uh, you know, mix flowers and vegetables and some specifically repel insects and will help things to produce well. Uh, peas are good things to do uh, the year before you plant uh, potatoes in that area because it's a nitrogen fixing bacteria. So when you move things around, uh, that works well. Um, oh yeah, and if you don't grow garlic already, uh, that's a fall planted thing. You do that uh, sometime in uh, September or so, mulch it up and that'll be coming up next year already. So that's something you can plant this year for next year. Uh, anything else or should I just wander on? Um, I think that's it for questions at the moment. Okay, good. So, um, so now the other uh, crops that you can plant now uh, are uh, your coal crops, your broccoli, uh, cabbage, uh, cauliflower, uh, Brussels sprouts. Um, I, this is from Ramona Snell, who uh, uh, is the uh, owner of a farm in Buxton, who is one of my vegetable gurus whenever I need uh, information about something like that. So when um, she said that the, the broccoli, Brussels sprouts and all of that, really want to be planted in the fall because they taste better and more tender if you're harvesting them pretty close to the first frost of the year. Uh, that's what she does at her farm. She doesn't really plant anything early. Uh, and it uh, works very well for them. Um, if, uh, you, and what I, like especially in my garden, they're, they're the ones that I plant every year, but every garden should have what I consider perennial ve uh, vegetables. 
my favorite vegetable of any time is asparagus. And I first planted that about 20 years ago. And that bed is uh, going down a little bit. But I replanted another bed uh, about four years ago. And we can have asparagus five times a week from May 15th through the 4th of July because it keeps producing all the time. Uh, the bed lasts forever. Uh, we just picked two, uh, uh, a quart and a half of strawberries earlier this week, the first of the season down here, uh, which come back every year. Um, you have to thin them out quite a bit, do some work. Rhubarb is another perennial vegetable which comes along. Uh, it uh, does very well. Some people don't like it at all. Some people do, but it is reliable and you can't kill it. Uh, plant some blueberry bushes. I've got a peach tree that I'm so excited about because uh, it's actually going to produce a few peaches for the first time this year. I've had some before, but uh, on a peach tree, it's only going to live about 10 or 15 uh, years and then it's a short live tree you didn't do anything wrong when it dies that's just the way it goes um uh my method for the soil is i i don't let take any leaves away from my property i've got uh, uh pallets that i can get free from the dump and i tie them together with rope and i put the leaves in there every fall i've got eight pallets, uh, eight pallet bins of leaves. And when that rots, like when I pull out the peas, if I'm not gonna plant anything where they were, I take the, uh, what it's called leaf mold, not compost, and spread that on the garden, let it continue rotting on top of the garden. And I'll uh, use my broad fork or U-bar, because I uh, really don't use gasoline powered uh, uh, garden tools except the snowblower because I I don't like the noise of them. Uh, people spill gasoline and a lawnmower produces more uh, pollution than even the dirtiest car. So, uh, you know, I've got an electric lawnmower and I don't use a rototiller and till that stuff in. And that gets the organic matter into the soil. So I don't really need much chemical fertilizer uh, what I do use is uh, from Vermont and made from chicken manure. It's organic and so forth. So th that is what I really like to use in the vegetable garden. Um, okay. Um, okay. Any other questions or? Uh, um, I don't see any questions. Okay, okay super. So, um, and, uh, oh yeah, so I also have a uh, one official composter made out of um, plastic that I got from the town of Cape Elizabeth uh, Recycling Committee. And that's where I put the food waste because uh, I don't want, when, when I put them in the old fashioned pallet kind, the uh, crows would come along and spread it all over, uh, spread the uh, coffee filters and the uh, tea bags and all of this stuff all over the yard. And uh, Nancy sort of said, no, we don't want to do that. So we, <laughs> we, we went for a neat one for the vegetable scraps. Um, and it, yeah, so, okay, what else did I, I've been skipping. Uh, oh yeah, now, now again, if uh, you wonder if you have space for a vegetable garden, at this time of year, you might think you don't, but you can always dig up some lawn. I'm a big fa fan of digging up lawn and replacing it with a vegetable garden. You could, you could still at this point, if you want, get vegetables and get, you know, big pots, you know, two or three gallon pots and, uh, put them in the sunniest part of the yard. As a matter of fact, if you are, are gonna be home all the time, and most of us are, 
you can pick them up and move them around to where the sun is, where the sun goes on. So, uh, because many people in the urban environments grow a lot of vegetables just in pots. And you can still do that, uh, plant those at any time uh, coming along here. Um, okay, I think that's a 10 minutes short of what I was scheduled to do, but I pretty much run out of what I was gonna say. So are there any questions or want me to add anything else at this point? Um, Tom, there was a question that was asked by someone who couldn't be here wanting to know if you have any personal favorite vegetables, either in your garden or overall. Well, uh, asparagus that I talked about is my absolute favorite vegetable, and I like that. Uh, I, I read, and I don't know if this is true, that E.B. White in Brooklyn uh, and Catherine Burke White uh, had uh, asparagus three meals a day when it was in season at their Brooklyn farm. And I haven't gone that far, but I, I could do that. I, and we're big pea fans in this family. We, uh, I'm growing two uh, types of edible pod peas and four types of uh, shelling peas. Uh, the edible pods are the standard sugar snap and there's one I got from Fedco that is a Native American brand that uh, comes in just a little bit earlier. So don't, I don't like it as well as the sugar snap, but it comes in a week earlier and I go for that. My favorite uh, shelling pea is one called Iona Petit Pois, which um, the French have smaller shelled peas than the typical American peas. And these are wonderful uh, 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 flavored pea. So I like that, but I also uh, grow night and uh, there's a green arrow, which is slightly later pea, so you can extend the season a little bit. So we generally have peas from July 1st or so, about when the asparagus starts going gone, and all the way through, you know, probably early to mid-August. Uh, and I'm also a huge fan of both the big slicing tomatoes, which I like in sandwiches, and the little cherry tomatoes. Uh, I like one called Sweet Million, which I didn't find this year. Uh, I can get Sweet 100 sometimes. And uh, Sun Gold, although the Sun Gold, after the first couple of weeks, splits and it's not as perfect as some of the other ones. But, uh, and you know, we do greens, uh, grow a lot of potatoes as well. Uh, I like particularly uh, red fingerling potatoes that you can get early in the season and just steam them up and uh, have them with the, the summer meals. They, they're, they're nothing that we store, but uh, they're a good summer potato. And then we have storing ones to eat the rest of the year. So those are my highlights, but we grow just about everything. Uh, we have a question. Some of us in town have raised beds. What are your thoughts there? Okay, if they are more work, <coughs> um, but they have quite a few advantages. First off, they dry out more quickly, so you have to water them. Uh, and they, uh, and it depends, they will rot. I would not build raised beds with treated, pressure treated lumber because I don't trust the chemicals in that. Uh, but especially if you're uh, my age and, and uh, so on and have a bad back, having the, uh, the vegetables about six inches or so or even more higher makes it a lot easier to work on. So you're not bending down so far and getting up. And if, if that's what you've got room for, go for it. I mean, uh, I, I've never done it because we've got 
the former strawberry fields that uh, our house was built on and it's good land and we do it. But uh, uh, if, if it worked for you, go for it. Just you know, make sure you're probably gonna have to water them a lot more than you would if it were in the, uh, in the ground. And uh, you probably are gonna have to add more compost at the end of the season if you're gonna reuse it and so forth. But yeah, they're fine. Uh, we have a question. I make my own kombucha. I was told the SCOBY is good for the garden. Any thoughts? Uh, that's not anything I'm familiar with. Uh, uh, I, I, I know a lot of people who uh, make compost tea and use that and uh, it, it works well. I have never done that. I just sort of use the compost itself. Uh, but I'm not familiar with the kombucha uh, in the garden at all. Do you have any particular gardening or vegetable books that mean a lot to you or which you would recommend? Okay, I started off, that's how old I am, uh, with uh, Crockett's Victory Garden, Crockett's Flower Garden, and I think the other one is Crockett's Kitchen Garden. But the Victory Garden is the one that I still have and will still go to every now and then to look at. It's basic, it's really good, uh, basic stuff on you know vegetables and so forth. I've read many others. Uh, uh, you know, there's, oh God, my, my mind is going. There's a guy who lives in industry, who's a seed saver, Will Bonsell, he knew it would come to me, who is a little bit flaky, but he's written a really good book on how to, you know, his goal in life is to buy nothing. He wants to produce all of his food on his garden. And I don't go that far, but it's a fascinating read if you get his book. Uh, so that is good. The, uh, uh, oh God, the guy on the coast, his wife writes or wrote for the Washington Post and whose name I can't come up with. Ah, but I, their books are too good. But uh, he invented the uh, Crow U bar, the broad fork that sold at Johnny's. Someone's got to remember the name, but I can't come up with it. But uh, yeah, so yeah, th those are good books there as well. Um, so um, I think we have a comment. Uh, Elliot Coleman is good as yeah, well. That, that, that's who I meant, Elliot Coleman. Okay, she got, <laughs> she got it. <laughs> good work. Thank you. Uh, it, but my mind just bounces around sometimes and I can't come up with names as quickly as I used to. And one last question from someone who couldn't be here wanted to know, um, from all of your various gardening columns, do you have any Col particular column that stands out as one of your favorites or do you favor most of them? Uh, I did a, one on uh, that was really became funny. I uh, went with my wife to Connecticut and, I, and uh, I was stuck in a hotel room with nothing to do and they wanted a poem on tools and uh, I, I went on a rant uh, about uh, power tools and uh, how you know most of the tools that uh, we have we inherited from Nancy's grandparents and uh, you know using those and how you know the only ones that I didn't uh, use were shovels and spades because I mistreat spoles shovels and spades because I try to use them with a pry bar and pull rocks and broke all the ones I inherited there. And it was one of the funniest columns I ever wrote. My editor really liked it. That's and it had nothing to do with gardening. It was just <laughs> tools. Well, I think we have hit upon um, everybody's questions, Tom. Oh, so super. 
so I've enjoyed this. It, uh, it, it is a little disconcerting for me because uh, the one other Zoom it did was a smaller group and I could see everyone who was there and get facial reactions. So it's a little tough sort of doing it without seeing faces. <laughs> but well, we, uh, it's been fun. a good you. experience. No, well, thank you for inviting me. Thank you for being adaptable and for um, treating us to your knowledge and your passion. We're so grateful that we could host you at Rockland Public Library. And thank you everybody who came out to attend tonight. Uh, we appreciate it. And you have some clapping going on, Tom, and some various <laughs> thank yous as well. So, okay, thank you very much. It's been our pleasure and everyone uh, take good care. Take care, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.